Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Valentine's Church, Loveland, Ohio. I'm so glad to see all of you this morning. This morning, we were awakened in the early morning by one of the largest crashes of thunder I have ever heard in my entire life. It literally shook the house and shook us out of bed, and it reminded me, Christ is risen! Truly is risen! Christ is risen! Truly is risen! Christ is risen! Truly is risen! Blessed is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Alleluia! This morning, we are reading the second chapter of James. Last week, we read the first chapter. This week, we're reading the second chapter. And it is incredibly important for us to know the second chapter of James because in the second chapter of James, we have a refutation of Protestantism. And so today, I am going to show you by sola scriptura, by the study of God's word, by the scripture alone, that the idea that Martin Luther had about justification by faith alone, called sola fide, is in error. In September of 1522, Martin Luther published the first Bible in the German language, which contained both Old and New Testaments, translated from the Hebrew Masoretic text, and a new edition of the Greek New Testament, just published by his frenemy, Desiderius Erasmus. In this work, Luther attempted to put all of Scripture in its appropriate Protestant context. He, however, in his introduction to the book of James, said quite typically, St. James's epistle is really an epistle of straw, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. It is obvious that Luther was very uncomfortable with James because it did not support his doctrine of sola fide, or salvation by faith alone which he felt was supported in the Pauline epistles. Even though he had to insert the German word allein, which means alone in German, into Romans 3.28, which says, Therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith, and here he inserted alone, without the deeds of the law. The only place where the scripture actually says alone, quote unquote, is here in James chapter 2, and it is actually the opposite of what Martin Luther said. So we are going to examine the thorn in Martin Luther's side. In this morning's reading, in which we read the whole chapter for context, we see that St. James starts with the moral teachings of the church, telling us what we should do first and how we should understand it theologically. As we see with all the apostolic fathers of the ancient church, the emphasis was first upon obedience to right moral action, fulfilling the commandments of Christ, and then, after this was completed, a theological sense of what it means. Theology was very much incarnated in the action of the community rather than forming a literary basis of knowledge. The church first is, and then it explains itself through orthodox theology which is a barrier that's set up around the unknowable mysteries of Christ. The church does not believe in theology first and then outwork that theology. We first are the church, incarnated by the Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the earth. And then Christ working through us gives us our theology. In James chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My brethren... Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and fine apparel, and there should also come into it a poor man of filthy clothing, and he pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothing and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here under my footstool. Have you not shown partiality amongst yourselves and become the judge of evil thoughts? This is echoed from Matthew 7, 1 through 5, where Jesus says, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with me what measure you use, it will be measured back to you again. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, that fleck of dust, but do not consider the plank, that beam of wood that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove that speck from your eye, and look, there is a plank of wood in your own eye. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. 
So Jesus tells us, do not despise the poor. Christ taught us not to despise or oppress anyone, especially the poor. In his Sermon on the Mount, he tells us that the poor are rich in faith, and they form the core of those who followed after Christ. The poor are rich. The poor can see God. The poor are those that God has blessed. Those who are rich and wealthy in the material gains of this fallen world believe that they have no need and do not seek after God. And so they miss out on God. They miss out on the blessings that God has to give. Surely St. James, the elder stepbrother of our Lord, had this teaching deeply impressed upon his memory from seeing Jesus Christ from his childhood work with those who were poor and destitute. Going on, it says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do not they blaspheme that noble name with which ye are called? Jesus says this in Luke 6, 20-23. Then he lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, for they, and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil. For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. So St. James continues to expound the original understanding of the gospel by echoing Christ's teachings in the Beatitudes, his Sermon on the Mount, and points out that he blesses the poor, the poor in spirit, the poor who are cast out by the wealthy, those who are excluded by the famous, those who do not have a place of position within society, and they have closeness to his kingdom. In verse 8, St. James continues, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, and also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This understanding also reflects what Christ teaches in Mark 12, 28 through 34, when he says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he was answering them well, and asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him and said, The first of all commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like unto this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all of our heart, with all of our understanding, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. In the Gospels, Jesus identified the whole message of the Old Testament law with loving God, with everything in our being, heart, mind, and soul, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. This was a radical departure from the way that the scribes and the Pharisees understood the law because it dramatically simplified everything and related everyone in every situation to a relationship with God in love. This is the Christian law of love. This is the perfect law of liberty, which St. James just spoke about in the first chapter of his Catholic epistle. Beginning in verse 14, St. James says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus, also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Thus, also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. This passage causes problems because people automatically see that it contradicts the doctrine of legal justification, championed by Martin Luther and the Reformers. 
meaning that God declares us righteous based on faith and not by works. This comes from a basic misunderstanding between Latin and Greek. In the Greek, the word dikaiosis, which is translated as justification, actually means in its original context to be made righteous. But in Latin, the word justificario means to be declared blameless in a court of law. This misunderstanding occurred when you read the Greek New Testament with legal Latin definitions, which was created when St. Jerome, a Roman lawyer, translated the Greek New Testament into the Latin Vulgate 400 years after Christ. What we read in the Latin does not actually mesh with what the apostles meant. This error was propagated and worsened when one man translated and sieved all of the scriptures through his own understanding. And it was compounded when another man, Martin Luther, did it again when he translated the Bible on his own. If you read verses referring to justification in the original Greek definition, there is no contradiction between James 2, 14 through 17 and the rest of the scripture, which commands us to do those works that are meat of repentance. God makes us righteous through our faith, which is lived out and proven in our works. If one continuous action of faith pours out from our heart into the world, it will manifest itself in all the works that we do. Faith and works cannot be separated. If you separate them, they die. The scripture addresses justification through faith, but this is never understood by the church to cancel out Christ's commandments to righteously act or dismiss the apostles' exhortation to do that which is just, good, and equitable. Just as our faith is not a work that saves us, neither do we save ourselves by having faith in God. So none of the actions flowing through our faith can be ascribed ultimately to us. Instead, it is the energy and the presence of the Holy Spirit, God's grace, manifesting in our lives. The works of the law, which were the Jewish ceremonial actions that tied the Jews to the Old Covenant, were never the same thing as the good works that we see in the New Testament. This basic misunderstanding is at the root of the anti-Orthodox and anti-Apostolic paradigm that took root during the Reformation. It is a basic misunderstanding. And those who taught the Reformed doctrines should have known better. All we can say is that they didn't study hard enough. St. James continues his thesis and says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Here we have a classic refutation in the Bible itself against the foundational tenets of Protestantism. These few verses are the reason why Martin Luther attempted to eject the book of James from the New Testament and called it a straw gospel in his foreword to this book in German. For everyone who takes scripture seriously, believing in sola fide, this should be enough to see that the Protestant presuppositions are not truly biblical and undermine the whole project of rejecting apostolic, conciliar, orthodox Christianity. The only thing that remains is the Holy Spirit, alive in the church, which holds the Bible as its core, its heart, and to separate one from the other kills both. The entire teaching is summed up in the last five verses of this second chapter. St. James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James chapter 2 is still problematic for many people because in this passage of scripture they see a works-based Christianity and this contradicts their favorite passages about faith-based salvation and other places in the scripture. But this Protestant understanding of faith alone is not based in the scriptures themselves and modern scholarship has identified that these are indeed misunderstandings of the original words of the scripture based on one little word in Latin that was mistranslated by St. Jerome a thousand years ago, before the Reformation. He used the word justificatio, a legal word that means to be declared righteous. But the apostles 
had used the word dikaiosis, which means to become righteous. Being declared righteous or to become righteous. You're not just declared righteous. Instead, the Holy Spirit transforms you from within and makes you new. And in that, you do the works of the Father. Based on this word and its logical conclusions, Martin Luther decided to ignore everything else that the scripture itself says, which is upheld by the councils and the fathers and the official teachings of the Orthodox Church, and chose to break with the apostolic gospel and to preach his own understanding of the gospel instead. Scripture shows us that faith and works are two sides of the same coin and cannot be separated. Just like the Bible and the church are dependent on one another to proclaim the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit, the inner condition and the outward manifestation are both necessary. It is no more earning salvation by doing good works than we earn salvation by having faith in God. Our faith is a gift from God, just as our works, which are necessary and always accompany faith, and are wonderful fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We cooperate with the grace of God. We submit to his spirit. And in this synergy, we are incorporating our lives with God's life and renewing and restoring all of creation in the process. These things cannot be separated. If we do artificially creating a dichotomy of faith and works, it is exactly like cutting the scripture out of the context of the church. It is like cutting the heart out of a man. When we cut the heart out of the man, the heart and the man both die. And so we remember with the collect today, O Lord, from whom all good things do come, grant us, thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things which are good, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. I have said these things to you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.